Erica here with Prep Scholar GMAT. Back today with how to attack GMAT word problems, best practices for success. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can get one-on-one -on -one online tutoring from me or another GMAT expert with Prep Scholar GMAT. You can head over to our website to sign up or, or learn more about our other customized online prep options. Links are in the description. And as always, if you like this video, we've got a lot more great GMAT content. So check out our channel and subscribe for updates on new videos and live streams. All right, let's start at the top. We've just started a new question on the quant section and it's a word problem. Now at this point, a lot of students panic. Word problems suck. No, this may be true, but whether or not they actually do suck, they're pretty common on the quant section. So we need a plan of attack to get the most value out of this question. So where do we start? Now, just like we discussed in our most recent reading comprehension video, investing time early on in a word problem can often save us time later on in the problem. Now, in reading comprehension, this early investment is in reading and interpreting the passage, and then predicting an answer to each question. In word problems, this early investment is spent on interpreting the problem. There are two questions you want to ask yourself when interpreting a problem. First, we need to figure out what we're being told. What pieces of information is the question presenting to you as true? Now, in critical reasoning, these would be your premises. Like premises, this information typically comes before the question itself. So you may know that x is a positive integer. You may know that d is twice the sum of a, b, and c. You may know that the sale price is 30% off the normal retail price. You may know that Alfonso gave three trading cards to Luis. This information will all be critical to answering the question. Now, while it does happen, it's very rare that the GMAT gives us information we don't actually need to solve the question. So assume that everything you read here is important. Also remember, what you don't know is just as important as what you do know. If the question doesn't tell you that Company M produced any cars last year, then we have to consider that Company M may have produced zero cars. If the question doesn't tell us that Yebin used an integer number of cups of flour to bake her cookies, we have to consider that she used fractional amounts of cups of flour. These considerations are often crucial to solving. Second, we need to figure out what we're being asked for. Now, this is an important step, so don't skip it. The test makers want you to trip up, so they'll often ask a different question than the one you want to answer, or include values from intermediate steps, so things you'd find on the way to the correct answer, as wrong answer choices. Figuring out what you're trying to solve for in advance helps you not to trip at the finish line by solving for the wrong thing. These two steps are the most important part of any problem, so don't start solving until this is done. Now, a large part of interpreting a word problem is translating the words into math. A key thing to recognize here is that specific words should clue us into different operations. So add, subtract, multiply, divide. We need to be absolutely fluent in these math words so that we can quickly turn a phrase into an equation or an expression. Now, I'm not going to list all of these math words here because there are quite a few, but a quick Google search for GMAT word problems or translate word problems will pull up a bunch of good lists that you can study. You can also develop your own list of GMAT math words by analyzing the problems that you work through. Now, one of the most difficult parts of many word problems is that they are so long. If we try to read everything at once, we're likely to confuse ourselves, need to reread the problem a bunch of times, or miss key pieces of information. The solution to this issue is to take one piece of info at a time. So read one piece of information, stop, interpret that piece of information, turn it into math if you can, and then move on. A tip, stop at punctuation. So if you've got a comma, a period, whatever, take a second to interpret what you just read before moving on to the next chunk of the question. Now, as you're going through and interpreting your problem piece by piece, be sure to write down what you're learning. If we figure out what the question is asking, then forget what the question is asking by the time we answer, we're likely to miss the question. If we take note of a piece of information, but then neglect to take it into account when solving, we're again likely to miss the question. If we turn a sentence into math, but then keep it in our heads, we're likely to forget the work we just did and then need to recreate it later, which wastes a ton of time. Now, on test day, assume that you have a three-second memory span. If you think you can hold an important piece of information in your head much longer than that, you are wrong, especially if you're trying to hold multiple important pieces of information in your head. 
Now, something's just going to get lost if you're trying to hold too many pieces of information in your brain, and the test makers are counting on you to do that. Don't lose yourself a problem by not taking two seconds to jot something important down. A quick note here. In addition to information from the problem, you also need to take note of information that you create. Now, if you define a variable to make an equation, then forget what that variable means partway through your math and get confused. You just set a trap for yourself, and then you fell right into that trap that you set. A good tip here is to jot down a note like that C and D equal number of shirts, not cost of shirts. Also useful, use logical variables. X and Y are the most commonly used variables, but they're usually not the best options. A good call is to use the first letter of related words, and this can help you remember which variable means what. When you're writing things down, you can set yet another trap for yourself by writing them down sloppily. When you've got values and equations all over your scratch paper, you aren't likely to know what any of it means. I wrote down 250. 250 what? I put down 30%. 30% of what? I wrote 2x plus 3. Is that what I'm solving for? Or is it a piece of information I'm given? You can avoid this common issue by organizing your information. A good move here is to create a table or a diagram. The scratch paper grid makes this super quick and easy. Also useful is general neatness. Put related equations near each other, line up your operators, don't scribble things out, but don't leave incorrect work easily legible. Finally, don't be lazy. If you're already taking the time to write something out, make sure you'll know what it means later. Remember, three second memory span. Now, you may go through this whole process using all of these best practices and still be completely lost on the problem. Sometimes we do our absolute best work and we still don't know what the problem is testing or how the information given is relevant to the question. At this point, we need to know when to move on. I recommend the 30 second rule. If you don't know what the question is asking for or, and have a potential approach to solving at 30 seconds in, the likelihood that things are going to get better on this problem is really low. So you're best served by making an educated guess and saving an extra minute and a half for another problem you're more likely to get right. Now, for a lot of students, this can feel like a failure, and it's tempting to keep struggling with the problem because we've already invested so much time in it. But actually, this is a success. Those 30 seconds spent on the problem saved us from wasting any more time on a problem that isn't likely to get us any points. This extra time is likely to get us points on another problem. So this is a victory. It's also common that we'll think we're on our way to a solution, but end up getting lost or going down an incorrect path. This is why it's critical that we recognize when we're spinning our wheels so we can go ahead and try something new. My motto here is that no progress equals a new approach. For instance, if I can't seem to create the equation that I want, I might instead try plugging in numbers or estimation using answer choices. A lot of people take failure to make a certain course of action work very personally. I should be able to do this. Now, this is the least productive thought process on this test. If it isn't happening, it isn't happening, and beating your head on the desk isn't going to make it happen. Try something else, and you can likely get the problem right. It's very possible that the problem just isn't designed to be solved easily the way you're going at it, and your next shot might get you there in 15 seconds. A final tip on this. Max out at three minutes on any given word problem. Some problems take more than two minutes to solve, and that's okay, as long as there are enough one minute problems on the section to balance them out. However, it's very rare that any time spent over three minutes is productive. I typically see that students spend the most time on problems they end up getting wrong, or they simply guess them correctly. That's something you could have done way earlier. Rather than continue working on a problem because you've spent so much time on it already and you think you must be close, move on. The sunk cost fallacy gets a lot of people on this test. Don't be one of them. If you have any questions on what we talked about today or suggestions for future videos, please leave a comment below. Thanks for watching and happy GMAT studies.